Mario Kart 8. Yeah, me and this thing go way back. It's so fun. I've been racing on these same tracks for nearly 10 years. That's literally like half my life. Well, that was the case until the announcement of the Booster Course Pass in 2022. What a weird time period to be a Mario Kart fan. A deluxe port of a Wii U title gets DLC five years into its life. Better late than never, I guess. 48 additional tracks for the price of $25. It's extremely hard to complain about that. Unless you're a Nintendo fan. Yeah, this announcement was pretty controversial. People's main concern was found in the graphics, and upon further inspection, yeah, this looked like dog water. Personally, I was super happy to see this new content, but I'll be honest, this announcement left us with a lot of questions. How would the track selection be? Will these tracks look better upon release? Would these tracks be revamped mechanically like in the base game? I mean, don't get me wrong, it was amazing seeing Mario Kart finally get something new, but there were a lot of things that raised a lot of eyebrows, and only time would truly tell. So today, I'm taking a look back on the whole thing from start to finish, critiquing the ups and the downs and all the above, and genuinely asking the question, how was the booster course pass? We have a lot to cover here, so strap yourselves in and let's get started. Starting off the pass is Wave 1 with the Golden Dash Cup and Lucky Cat Cup, and I'm just gonna be blunt, looking back on our first wave here, this was not the best first impression. I think by this point we can all agree we were starving for anything Mario Kart. I have been playing Mario Kart 8 since it's been out on the Wii U, so before all this, I had been playing these same courses throughout multiple stages of my life. No exaggeration. This includes childhood, puberty, taxes. I wasn't putting it past Nintendo. I was ready to play Thwomp Ruins till I was ruined. I know for me, I was living off that high of finally getting some new tracks to race on after playing this game for almost a decade. But now that that's settled, I feel like this wave overall doesn't have a lot of wow factor. I mean, some of these tracks I really enjoy. Shroom Ridge gets slept on a lot. I really like this course layout and especially the music, but I'm also looking at this like, okay, you're really gonna pick Shroom Ridge from the DS over something like Airship Fortress? Sky Garden was kind of a letdown. It's a solid course, but the overall aesthetic of the track is a big downgrade from the original, and I feel as though it could have been a little more grander, I don't know. Toad Circuit is complete filler, and it's ugly. Like, oh my gosh, it looks like these giant toads puked all over the track. You know it's bad when the 3DS outperforms you graphically, like jeez, like I understand a deadline rush, but this was horrendous. And unfortunately, uh, this track proudly showcased the inconsistency of the looks of these DLC tracks. For me personally, I've always been on the side of the graphics not really hampering the Mario Kart experience, but even for me, I feel like this inconsistency can be straight up jarring. It's more of an annoyance, like some of these tracks don't really seem like they have that Nintendo seal of approval slapped on them because I know for a fact they could do better than this. I mean, Choco Mountain isn't getting any beauty awards here, but at least it has some solid textured ground, whereas Toad Circuit couldn't even texture grass right. It seemed like graphically they were showing favoritism to well-known courses, but by doing this, it just made the tracks like these stick out even more and really just showed a lack of standards, but mainly consistency. Again, it didn't affect me as much. I just felt like, man, Nintendo, you could have done so much better. I'm like a parent, I'm not mad, I'm just, I'm just disappointed. Speaking of disappointment, Wave 1 was my first official introduction to Mario Kart Tour tracks. I played Mario Kart Tour a couple of times, I, I didn't like it, it could have been so much better, but I will say it was pretty cool seeing them preserve these tracks in this way. And honestly, I think we have Mario Kart Tour to partially thank for this DLC. Having all these tour tracks to archive was most likely one of the main incentives to release this DLC. And so Mario Kart Tour may have helped open this door of opportunity, but it also opened a door of including some of the blandest tracks in Mario Kart history. I really just need to get my thoughts out of the way with these courses. Um, I do not like the city tracks from Tour. The worst thing about them is you can totally tell they were directly ripped from a mobile game. They, they just feel bland and watered down in their track design. 
They're not all terrible, and we'll get to those soon enough, but I found that most of them were too barren with its obstacles, were either extremely big or extremely claustrophobic, and a lot of them just blend together for me. Like, is this London Loop or Madrid Drive? Wrong, it's Berlin Byways. These courses also pride themselves on having layout changes each lap, which is refreshing, but also can get a little chaotic at times. Like, just look at these mini maps. Is this a map or am I having a stroke? These tracks are also a nightmare on 200cc. Now, I've played my fair share of Mario Kart, so 200cc is no biggie, but man, these tracks were not designed with 200cc in mind. Well, technically none of these tracks were designed with 200cc in mind, but with these super tight spots and turns, some of these tracks are just terrible. Coming from a mobile game that's paced as fast as a turtle in a walker, it makes sense why these tracks just don't fit this speed. Even without 200cc, these tracks have terrible readability. What do I mean by this? Well, if a track is designed well, you should be able to naturally sense or read where you're supposed to go next. It's visually readable. I think that's partially why the base Mario Kart 8 tracks translate better to 200cc, not only because of their scale, but also because they have distinction in their track design. You can tell these tour tracks lack this element of readability due to all these giant red arrow walls everywhere you go. Some of these tracks just don't do a good job at naturally leading players around, and I think that's purely bad track design. I get that they have ever-changing routes, so they have to put stuff up like this, but that's just it. Like, some of these route transitions are just not very clear and distinct from one another. Being limited to driving in cities can be challenging to incorporate diversity. They try to incorporate landmarks for these locations, which is nice, but that's only for a very brief moment in each track. Again, not all of them lack in this way, but a good majority of them do, which is why I'm the type of guy that thinks racing in a wondrous Mario world is a lot less limiting, more readable, and captivating than driving the streets of Amsterdam. I understand the preservation mindset with these, and like I said, not all of them are terrible, but some of them shouldn't even see the light of day, and unfortunately rob quite a few spots from retro tracks that truly deserved them. One spot that wasn't wasted though was Coconut Mall, a classic. I really don't think this remake is half bad. I do think the escalators having clear signs to their directions is kind of lame, but overall there's not too many complaints until you get to the end. You see, they changed up the parking lot section where the ending cars are stationary, unlike the original. Even with a small detail like this, there was quite a bit of grumbling and complaining surrounding it. And for some of you, that may be surprising, but we're talking about Nintendo nerds here. With a franchise like this, they'll whine about anything. I know it's harsh, but it's true. And you know, it's one thing to, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I, I can't believe- L Luigi's L is backwards! Ninja Hideaway was a big surprise. This one always intrigued me because it never had a Mario Kart assigned to it. Come to find out later it was from Tour, but it felt a lot bigger in scope compared to the city track, so I never knew for sure when it was first released. I mean, I wasn't surprised to see it originated from Tour, something about it did feel off, but the theming was super cool, and I'm always shocked to see the sheer amount of branching paths they crammed into this course. Overall, pretty solid track. Uh, is there anything I missed? Um, Choco Mountain is pretty good. Okay, I know I kind of dogged on this wave for the most part, but I would be lying if I didn't say I enjoyed it when it first launched. Even though some of these courses felt like filler to me, it still felt amazing to finally have new tracks to play and experience. I'm not kidding when I say Mario Kart fans were starving by this point, and to finally see new scenery for the first time in years was huge. Even when the scenery was straight up ugly in some cases. When this wave was first released, it was exciting, but compared to what we eventually got, it's obvious that this is the weakest wave of the bunch. It may have been tolerable, but there was still so much more to anticipate, and about four months later, we would soon realize that this was just a little taste of what's to come.
Next up was Wave 2 with the Turnip Cup and Propeller Cup. Now this is what I'm talking about. A very solid track selection here, sprinkled with some huge fan favorites, an extremely iconic N64 track, and some nice surprises as well, with the biggest surprise actually being in the patch notes. Each wave in the past included patches slash updates with the first major notable update involving Coconut Mall. I guess the fans' cries were loud enough because they actually did it. They updated the parking lot section with moving cars. Wow, well done. This pass might actually be worth something now. This honestly shocked me. Like, I didn't think Nintendo would go out of their way to make an update like this. In fact, it gave a lot of us hope for future updates. I mean, if they did something like this, maybe they would go back and update the visuals and graphics for prior tracks. So this is what false hope feels like. For a DLC all about bringing back retro tracks from older Mario Karts, recognition should be a top priority. And lucky for us, Wave 2 does not disappoint in that department, giving us two of the most beloved tracks in Mario Kart history, Waluigi Pinball and Mushroom Gorge. Oh man! These are so great. Waluigi Pinball is an amazing addition, being as vibrant and charming as ever. This track pops, the music bops, and the charm never stops. Like, I like Waluigi Pinball. Is that a crime? Mushroom Gorge is one of my favorite tracks from Mario Kart Wii for multiple reasons, but one specific reason was because of a particular shortcut, and I know I wasn't the only one asking this question when it was first revealed. My main concern was, is the gap jump from Mario Kart Wii possible? And I'm extremely happy to say, yes, it is. Dude, this shortcut alone makes it one of my top tracks in this entire DLC. I get so excited playing this track online, and I've even had a few amazingly clutch moments taking this shortcut. It, it's so satisfying. The fact that this is even possible is, for me, a cool nod to the OG fans of the series. And it's just, it's just so fun. It's such a great course. It's good, okay, it's good. Another iconic addition was Calamari Desert from the N64. Now, this track was already pretty decent before, but the way they updated this course in particular kinda amazed me. The most memorable thing about this track is obviously the train, and in the original, it was always fascinating going off the beaten path and driving down the train tunnel. What they did with this remake is they added a track variation on lap two that leads you down the actual train track, making it a legit part of the course, which is awesome. This is a exactly what this track needed. Something that didn't take away from the original feel, but instead enhanced it by including its most iconic obstacle slash trait in a more substantial way. This also confirmed that some of these retro tracks wouldn't just be straight ports of the originals, but also included new features, which was kinda a relief because Wave 1 didn't really give off this vibe. However, these enhancements were fairly inconsistent. For example, they missed a golden opportunity to add an anti-gravity section in Waluigi Pinball. The track is practically made for something like that. Another track that probably could have used some enhancements is Seness Mario Circuit 3. This track is so generic that the thumbnail, the thing that's usually used to showcase a track's unique trait, just has a plain old pipe in its picture. They literally don't have anything special to show about this course, which is just, it's just so funny to me. It may be barren, it may look a little unpolished, but dude, this course layout is so much fun to race on, especially on 200cc. So yeah, uh, low-key, I'm kinda a fan of this track, not gonna lie. GBA Snowland is also another enjoyable track. The theme here is much more faithful to the original GBA course with the penguins, crystals, snowmen. It's so charming. It's a solid track with some fun shortcuts that's overall a little bit more bite-sized, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sydney Sprint was also a breath of fresh air compared to the Wave 1 city tracks. So much so, it actually gave some hope for the future of these courses, which was definitely needed, I will say. This one has some fun moments throughout the entire race, but honestly, the biggest takeaway is this headbanger of a song. Good grief! Of course, this wave ain't perfect. New York Minute is a track. <laughs> yep. I like the nighttime aesthetic, but that's really the only thing it has going for it. Other than that, it's one of the easiest and most basic city tracks in this whole DLC. And then we have Sky High Sunday. This track is the complete opposite of its theme. It is bland. 
This course was our first officially labeled new track, and if we're speaking in Booster Course Pass terms, the quote-unquote new tracks aren't really new, but more like early access. These tracks are still based from Mario Kart Tour. They're not made from the ground up for this DLC. Rather, they're just announced for Mario Kart 8 first and eventually make their way to Mario Kart Tour. This was kind of cool having courses released before slash alongside Tour, but it still doesn't take away the fact that some of these mobile tracks are so watered down. Sky High Sunday is just trash. There's nothing about this track that's fun to me. For starters, let me show you the track layout. That's it. And what's with these railings at the start? They have no solid collision, which not only threw me off the first time playing this, but it also just makes this track look unfinished. This was also the first course in the DLC to have anti-gravity play a prominent part, but it's not like they did anything interesting with it. Part of me thinks that Nintendo decided to make this entire track anti-grav just to make the fans shut up about the lack thereof. I mean, Mario Kart Tour doesn't have any anti-gravity as a mechanic. It feels like a decision they just randomly threw in there. I don't know, it's kind of a shame. I really do like the look of this course. It really pops with color, but at the end of the day, just because it looks sweet doesn't mean the gameplay is. But honestly, those two tracks are the only gripes I have with this wave. Overall, this selection was way better than the first batch, and honestly got me a lot more hopeful for the future of this DLC. Not only was our selection here solid, but I also thought that some of the tracks even looked better. It seemed like Nintendo was taking steps forward, and it would only take another four months to see if those steps continued moving forward in the right direction. It's time for Wave 3. Finishing off the top row, we have the Rock Cup and Moon Cup. And well, I would say we have about a 50% solid track right here. It's not that the other half is bad, they're just kind of mid at best. Like Rock Rock Mountain, I have nothing against this track, it's not bad, but it's not great either. The two city tracks of this wave are also pretty forgettable. Just like London Loop, my memory is a bit foggy for this course. I know there's some chain chomps out and about, I don't know. Berlin Byways is an okay time. I know there's some womps out and about, I don't know. And since we're getting all the negative stuff out of the way, uh, Merry Mountain is another perfect example of visuals don't carry all the weight, cause man, this track is kind of boring. My main complaint is it's so bland with its track layout. There's nothing interesting about it gameplay-wise. I give it points for looking nice, and the Christmas theme is cool and all, but the fact that I can share my entire opinion on just this straightaway alone proves how uninspired this track layout is. Now for the other half of these courses. Let's start with Boo Lake, another great revamp of the GBA original. Who knew Boo Lake actually had a lake? I like this course design. It's cool they utilize both anti-grav and underwater near the end home stretch. I also really loved the original song on the GBA. The intro was so incredibly eerie, and I say all this just to comment, they did not have to go this hard on the remix. Peach Gardens, man, now this one surprised me. You know, this track wasn't like my favorite on the DS or even the Wii, and this version plays just like the original, you know, past the fountain, through the hedge maze, across the Monty Moles. But then something happens unexpectedly on the final lap. The course takes you down a path and turns you around to race the entire track backwards? I was shocked yet again, because not every course in this pass has variations to this degree. So to see something like this randomly pop up from time to time always catches me off guard. My favorite part is how the track shifts from driving through the hedge maze the first two laps to flying over it during the final lap. It's so cool. And now for the heavy hitters, starting with Maple Treeway. It had been so long since I last raced on this course, I honestly forgot how good it was. And wow, this was the first course in this pass that kind of blew me away with its visuals. I mean, it wasn't perfect, obviously, but comparing this to what we got in any of the previous waves to me is night and day. It could also be the aesthetic of this track is just naturally pleasing to the eye, but I don't know, I think it looked pretty good. And the final course of this wave, 3DS Rainbow Road. Oh, it's so beautiful. This was one of my top picks for this pass. It's the most captivating Rainbow Road in the entire series. I'm just happy it made it in. You can tell just by looking at the Rainbow Road itself, they actually put in some effort to make this look presentable. 
I know a few people commented on the skybox looking a little out of place, but honestly, for this Rainbow Road specifically, I think it fits it really well. Where other Rainbow Roads are themed in plain space, this Rainbow Road always felt more galaxy-themed, if that makes sense. Like, involving more planets into its design and whatnot. I'm just glad that this course wasn't as ignored compared to previous courses in its presentation. In fact, I felt like a lot of this wave was better graphically. Even Mary Mountain deserves some more credit. I love the starting line section with the little town and the red and green tinted pavement. And as you drive out, you see a beautiful sky and sunset. Like, I'll admit, it's super cozy and fun from a thematic standpoint. Based on what we got here, I think they did take another step forward all around with this wave. We got some of my top picks for tracks, a couple of sleepers, which seemed unavoidable at this point, and of course, a few big surprises, with another huge surprise found in the patch notes yet again. In addition, that was completely out of the blue. Kinda like showing this cat. Custom item rule sets. You can now select specific items to toggle on and off in versus races, battle modes, and even online friend lobbies. Okay, eight-year-old me would have killed for something like this. It's great because the customization isn't limited at all. Want to become an invincible god? Be my guest. You can also live out your worst nightmare. This is such a welcomed addition to this game. Like, any chance to make Mario Kart even more chaotic is fine in my book. Even though I thought this feature was awesome upon release, uh, I never used it. Like, not even once. This footage you're seeing right now? First time. It's such a welcomed addition, and it's not like they needed to give us anything like this. It's the Booster Course Pass. This kind of stuff is just a cherry on top of everything. I swear, if they drop any more surprises, I myself might drop to the floor. Birdo, who originally hit the track. I'm sorry, what now? It was February 2023, a few months after Wave 3. Wave 4 was announced in a direct with probably the most bizarre addition to this booster course pass. New playable characters. Now, this was a heavily discussed topic already with this DLC. If they were porting over Mario Kart Tour tracks, why wouldn't they port over the very thing that Mario Kart Tour did best? fan service. It didn't seem like a far-fetched dream. In fact, it felt very likely and needed by this point. However, this was the booster course pass. If Nintendo were to do something like this, they would need like a character pass or something, right? Nintendo proves yet again that they are the most unpredictable company in the gaming industry. Not only did they decide to add characters halfway through these waves, but free of charge as well. It was also confirmed that these characters were limited to previous Mario Kart games. But if Mario Kart Tour was included in that, uh, let's just say we wouldn't have a problem. Again, this is something that Nintendo didn't need to include, but wow, like this was yet another pleasant surprise from them. Initially, I really just thought these courses were the only agenda with this DLC. I mean, this was advertised as a booster for courses from the beginning, but with the addition of random updates and patch notes and now additional characters, this is becoming one of the best value DLC packs I've seen in recent years. <laughs> and we're only halfway through it. Okay, on to wave four with the Fruit Cup and Boomerang Cup. And dude, this might be my favorite set of tracks in this whole pass. We got some top tier picks for this wave. Our first GameCube track, surprisingly, and some of the best tour tracks in this entire DLC. But before we get into that... Wait a, Wait a minute. minute! Who, Who are, are you? you? Birdo, the first character in the Booster Course Pass DLC for additional courses and cups and new tracks to race on. What a fitting inclusion. I'm still shocked. Dare I say flabbergasted. They just threw this at us for no reason. The value of this pass was already good enough. Like, I'm not complaining. I'm just like, well, okay then. Birdo was our first pick, which honestly was a weird choice in my opinion, but we had five more slots to look forward to. I wasn't losing sleep over it. Okay, I lied. Releasing one single character was strange, but seeing all these open slots brought so much more anticipation for the next upcoming waves. The additions to the roster also brought a patch that would change the Mario Kart 8 meta forever. If you played any Mario Kart 8 online before this wave, I'm sure this combination was burned into your retinas. 
Waluigi in the Wild Wiggler. I don't know why, but during this whole DLC thing, I just assumed they wouldn't touch any of the balancing. My brain was wired to Waluigi riding a wild wiggler. Like, I just assumed this meta would be taken to the grave, right next to me playing Thwomp Ruins. But this was also one of the best changes, if not the best patch change in this DLC, because this meta was in dire need of a mix-up. Of course, there will always be a definitive combo, but at least for this short time, things were evolving and evolving fast. Time trial records were being shattered, creators were losing their minds. It was nice to have such a drastic change for the more competitive scene. It increased speculation and experimentation, and it was cool to see discussion in this area again. What drastic changes did they make, you might ask? I don't know. Nintendo was very vague with their patch notes, simply stating, improved the performance of some characters in vehicle customizations. Gee, thanks. All I know is Waluigi wasn't king anymore, and it was finally time to let some other characters and carts have the spotlight. What were we talking about again? Oh, Singapore. Singapore Speedway is probably the best city track in the entirety of this DLC. I think what it comes down to is the amount of variety that's found throughout the whole course. Most of these city tracks don't have half the stuff Singapore has. Lighting through giant fountains, boost rings, speed panels, this place even has some nice pop to its color scheme. It's not boring, bland, barren, or even claustrophobic. Can't say the same about these two. Amsterdam Drift, snooze. I can't even remember a fraction of this course. Like eventually you drive through a big flower bed or something, but wow, uh, this one's a sleeper for sure. And Bangkok Rush, man, this track could learn a thing or two about personal boundaries. This course feels tight. Like some of these turns and paths do not feel like they're meant to be in Mario Kart. It kind of feels like an unpolished custom track. It doesn't feel quite right. I actually liked this course when it was first released and honestly, I don't fully mind it. It's definitely a step up from other tour tracks, but that's not really a high bar to surpass. But if we want to talk about surpassing the bar, holy crap, Yoshi's Island. Oh my God. Gosh, this is a phenomenal tour track. The fan service here is off the charts. Literally every turn, there's a nod or a reference to Yoshi's Island with the obstacles, custom mechanics, custom assets. It's amazing. You collect Yoshi coins instead of generic coins. There's a custom start theme and results theme. And even the course music itself is such a jolly remix of the original Yoshi theme. Unlike most tour tracks, the visual style doesn't seem that ugly here, but actually plays in its favor. It feels like a Yoshi's Island aesthetic. It's colorful, it's cartoony, it's expressive. I personally think this was the biggest shocker in the past for me. The attention to detail can't be understated. I also love the ending with the cloud and the forming bridge. It's it just, it's so good. Look, I know this track may not be big in scale, but the charm and detail absolutely was. Also on my favorites list is Waluigi Stadium. This was one of my top picks being one of my top favorites from Mario Kart Wii. Surprisingly, we're four waves in and this is our first track from Mario Kart Double Dash, which is kind of a shame. But oh boy, what we got here was an amazing track with amazing visuals. The mud texture here is literally on par with the base Mario Kart 8 tracks. This course is incredibly fun to race on and I'm so glad they kept the half pipes in the piranha plant section. They also added a couple of alternate paths using these other half pipes, which was super cool. And if we're on the topic of half pipes, DK Summit makes its grand return. I think they did this course justice. There's nothing to complain about really. I mean, even the DK Summit double is possible, which again is so cool they allow OG strategies like this. This is one of those courses that if it didn't make its way into the pass, there would be riots in the streets. I don't know if I can say the same about Mario Circuit DS. Yeah, pretty strange pick here, but uh, someone's gotta say it. This track doesn't get enough credit. This is a great revamped track. I really enjoy racing on this one. It's a standard circuit, but I think the layout is satisfying to drift around. It was also nice to see this cool little forest section they added. GBA Riverside Park. I, I, I didn't really know how to segue into this. This track is an amazing revamp. First of all, I love the cozy sunset vibe with the jungle falls and river visuals. There's lots of depth and verticality throughout the track and the last spiral through the mountain and tricking through the waterfall to finish the lap just is 
Chef's Kiss. They also have these. What are they called? Like patooties? Patooies? They're the things that come out of the river and start walking on the track. And to me, that's such a charming obstacle for such a charming track. I don't know, man. This wave was pretty stinking solid. I loved a good portion of these tracks. And by this point, it was kind of expected that every wave would have some sort of Mario Kart Tour trash. But wow, what a great start to the second half of this pass. Whew, on to wave five. Four months had passed and wave five was released with the Feather Cup and Cherry Cup. And uh, these, these tracks are all right. We have a couple of great picks here, but I'll be honest, this wave is pretty forgettable for me, at least when it comes to the tracks, because how could you forget something as cursed as Wiggler on the Wild Wiggler next to some Wigglers? We got a good chunk of characters in this wave, as well as some more balance changes to mix up the meta. And the next inclusion to the roster was Kamek. It's pretty surreal finally seeing this guy make his way into a mainline Mario Kart. His history dates all the way back to Mario Kart 64 being cut from the main roster during its beta stages. So honestly, if anyone, this guy deserved a spot and it's nice to see him finally fulfilling that. Wiggler from Mario Kart 7 makes his return. Interesting pick, I will say. Like, I don't know if anyone was looking at the Mario Kart 7 roster and thinking, Oh man, this is what we need! Wiggler wouldn't be my first pick. I think Queen Bee would have been a more memorable rep from Mario Kart 7. Because, like, I don't know when the next time we're going to see this thing. And last, but certainly not least, my boy Petey Piranha makes his grand return. Oh man, it's so good to see this dude back. Petey is one of those characters that's slightly obscure, but refuses to die and continues to live on through spin-offs. It's kind of a shame quite a few characters end up like this, but in my opinion, Mario Kart is a perfect spot for them. I love his design and animations. His stats may not be the best, but I do not care. I think his spot was definitely deserved. Speaking of definitely deserved, Sunset Wilds definitely deserved better. I'm not exaggerating here for a bit or anything. When I say Sunset Wilds was one of my most anticipated tracks in this DLC, I mean it. This was just disappointing. For starters, the layout is super flat and reminds me of a SNES track. Most of these other GBA revamps add some sort of depth or verticality to its design, which actually adds a lot, surprisingly. And it's not like they didn't add any depth in its landscape. There's just not much here. Compared to a GBA track like Riverside Park, where its turns and landscape feel much more natural, this track not only feels flat, but falls flat in this department. But by far the biggest crime this track commits is the fact that they didn't implement its most iconic trait, how the track gets darker as the sun sets each lap like in the original. A track that is a little more faithful to the original is Daisy Cruiser. This track setting is amazing. This one is definitely a standout among other Mario Kart tracks. The layout itself is a little on the simple side. I do think this concept definitely has potential to be a bit more grand, but it's a solid track as is. But now it's time for the annual tour trashing. These city tracks, man, they're, they're just forgettable. I know quite a few people like Athens Dash, and I mean, it's all right. It's certainly not my favorite. I feel like it's sort of cobbled together weirdly, like it has its moments, but I honestly think this one is a little overhyped for me personally. Los Angeles Laps? Uh, Vancouver Velocity? Eh. Like, I'm serious here. I'm, I'm kind of struggling to find anything else to say about these tour courses. Los Angeles Laps is fine. It's just that nothing really jumps out at me. I'm sorry, it feels super generic to me. Like, I like the theme and the music, but man, I don't know what to say. Vancouver Velocity gives me a similar feeling. There's really nothing special about this course. I like that it adds a couple of anti-grav sections and driving through a skate rink was sort of cool, but again, I've played both of these courses multiple times now and there's nothing about them that does it for me. I can't say that they're really bad, it's just that they're generic and having these two tracks specifically in the same cup is partially the reason why I think this wave in general is pretty forgettable. I mean, even a track like Moonview Highway is a little forgettable. It's a great track, I'm not saying it's bad. It's one of the better city courses in Mario Kart, but I don't know, it's good, but I feel like it's not as recognizable as a Koopa Cape. Now this is a straight classic. You can't go wrong with some Koopa Cape. I will say over the years, this section in particular has been <clears throat> watered down. 
Like, the original version is so much better. Using the current to go faster all while dodging these electrical things, it adds a little more challenge and it's great. But ever since Mario Kart 7, they've turned it into a simple underwater section and removed its obstacles, which kind of slows it down and overall makes this section less exciting. A water section that is exciting can be found in Squeaky Clean Sprint. Wow, what another great surprise from Tour. This track is just swimming with charm. I know this is most people's favorite part, but getting sucked down the drain is such a fun and goofy part of the track. And gliding over the toilet that shoots out water to boost you up to this path just puts a smile on my face. I don't really know how to properly describe this track. Like, it's just so playful with its setting. Driving through the sink, finding a wedding ring in the drain, you can see this Goomba bathing in the bathtub. This track's innovation reminds me of a modern Mario Kart track. It just makes you think what they could have done if they thought of this concept in base Mario Kart 8. It's fun, it's playful, and one of my favorites in this booster course pass. Wave 5 definitely had its moments, both good and bad, but what I will say is this wave overall had a good amount of content tied to it. I mean, eight tracks, three new characters with multiple balance changes. It was impressive to see the sheer amount of content increase with each wave and with no extra charge. I mean, it's really, really hard to complain about that. But alas, it was time to gear up for the finale. Two more cups, two more characters, and two more mediocre tour tracks. I mean, come on, it's routine at this point. The final send-off of the Booster Course Pass Wave 6. Man, what a journey. We got the Acorn Cup and Spiny Cup, as well as the regularly scheduled random additions and patches. For starters, they added a music player to the main menu. This gives me a chance to talk about this DLC's music again, because not enough people talk about these remixes. Some standouts would be the DS tracks like Shroom Ridge and Mario Circuit, and the GBA tracks, I mean, these are amazing too. Sky Garden is a banger. And even though I dogged on a lot of these city tracks, quite a few of them have some catchy beats, I can't lie. Sydney Sprint, Singapore Speedway, Vancouver Velocity. There's seriously not that many bad tracks in this list, which is impressive for 48 tracks. I encourage you, if you have the game, go to this music menu and take a listen to a couple of tracks, and you'll understand my amazement. They're extremely good. They also casually dropped the most interesting patch in my opinion, which states, made it so you can't acquire strong items when taking an item box by stopping or driving in reverse, or taking an item box that is in the same location multiple times during a race. If you don't know what this means, they basically attempted to nerf bagging. If you don't know what bagging is, it's a competitive strategy to purposely drop yourself to lower ranks to receive powerful items. Some would even fully stop at item sets till they received what they wanted. It's a fairly common strategy at higher level lobbies, and with some tracks it's even encouraged to do this compared to front running. This patch is interesting to me because everyone sort of freaked out about it and then just realized they can still bag but just a little differently. It's certainly a change to the strategy, no doubt about it, but it also doesn't fully stop anyone from using this technique. It's a good change all around, obviously people are supposed to be racing and not just sitting at the first item set all day. Definitely one of the more notable attempts of changing the Mario Kart meta. But if we're gonna talk about meta, we need to see who the last two picks for the roster are. Diddy Kong! Finally, after being omitted for so long, he's back, baby! Great to see him here! And Funky Kong? Yes! Probably the most anticipated character to be added. Solid last two picks for the roster. Uh, oh, uh, Pauline? I, I mean, I, I thought there were only two, but uh, all right. Three amazing picks. What a surprise. Like I said, three amazing picks. What a surprise. Four additional characters added. Wow, uh... What the heck happened? Not only that, but 17 additional Mii costumes as well? This was us, and this was Nintendo. They just straight up poured out the rest of what they had in the tank for this wave. Diddy Kong, like I said, was a great addition to the roster. It really felt like he hadn't left. 
The dude's been on a kart racing hiatus for a while, and to see him back in action feels right. Funky Kong was the character I think everyone was anticipating, which is 100% valid. It's so freaking cool to see this guy back as well. The dude is the face of Mario Kart Wii, one of the most memorable characters in the Mario Kart franchise, and honestly, one of the best in my opinion. He's just as expressive as ever, goofy voice clips and all, and his trick animations are sweet. It would have been devastating not seeing him here, but it's like the perfect character to cap off the Mario Kart veterans. And if Funky is the perfect cap for the Mario Kart legends, Pauline is the perfect addition as a newcomer. Pauline has made such a resurgence in the Switch's life with Mario spin-offs and whatnot, and it felt like the only game that was missing on her resume was Mario Kart. She fits in like a glove. I love her animations. Again, this spot was most expected, but also well-deserved. Pichette was the opposite of that, dumb and unexpected. And then the Mii costumes, like wow, these are pretty insane. I actually really like a lot of them. They even went the extra mile and included special trick animations for specific costumes. You really think this sussy Moo Moo animation was in the base game? Uh-uh, no way. Looking at this roster post-DLC, it finally feels complete. It has the star veterans, the overlooked and omitted, and even a newcomer that fits perfectly. Mario Kart 8's base roster always felt weird without some of these characters, but they truly wrapped up this roster right, in my opinion. Obviously, I would have loved to see some more newcomers in the mix, but I think this roster was a great conclusion to the finale of this Mario Kart era. But guys, again, this is the Booster Course Pass. And this Waves track selection has a little taste of everything. Fan favorites, mediocrity, surprised to see you here, surprised to see you like this, and Daisy Circuit. Daisy Circuit is a fine track, kind of one of those more interesting picks, but I mean, it's fine for the most part. The remix music sounds amazing, and I love the warm sun aesthetic. I mean, the highlight intro makes this course look so cozy and beautiful. The track itself, though, I mean, I don't know, I honestly remember this one being a bit better on the Wii, and I can't put my finger on why that is. It's pretty standard, it's nothing too crazy, I don't know if it's Mario Kart 8's engine that's throwing me off, but I just remember this one being a bit more fun. It's not bad at all, however, I think they could have probably picked a more exciting chorus for being in one of the last cups. If we really want to talk about an eye raiser, look no further than Rosalina's Ice World. Definitely one of the more forgettable tracks from Mario Kart 7. The theme here is cool, I like the fact that you can see floating planets in the sky from Mario Galaxy, but you can totally tell they made a standard ice course and then just threw Rosalina's name in the title. Take out the planets and rename this to Pauline's North Pole and no one would think twice. It's not my top pick for sure, it definitely has its moments. This first section with this narrow corner has cool potential for trapping, and the additions of these half pipes shortly after are a nice touch. But other than that, uh, this track is pretty average. It's cool from a thematic standpoint, but there's nothing about this course that makes me say, wow, that was fun, I want to play that again. No, no, that's, uh, that's DK Mountain's job. DK Mountain is one of my favorite tracks in this DLC. It's great. Such a fun layout to drive around, and guess what? Yes, the ending gap jump is possible. I just want to pause here and appreciate the amount of leniency that this DLC had with their course design. Most, if not all, the notable advanced shortcuts from these past tracks are here in full form. Like, they could have easily pulled the plug and patched a lot of them. But part of what makes some of these tracks so great is because of the interesting techniques that are found in them. Anyways, <laughs> DK Mountain is a track that doesn't really need a lot of changes. However, I think this was another missed opportunity with adding some sort of anti-grav when scaling down the mountain. But that's just a tiny nitpick I have. The track looks bright and colorful, the textures look good, and considering we got two Donkey Kong reps in this wave, I think DK Mountain was a perfect inclusion. You know the drill by now, it's tour time. We got two final city tracks from Tour, with nothing super substantial to say about them. I'm sorry, I'm not really trying to sound like a broken record here. Uh, let's start with Madrid Drive! To give credit where credit is due, there is quite a bit of diversity found throughout this course. Driving through an art museum, or a football field, or even a marketplace, I mean, there's a lot here. However, I can't help but feel like this track is still flat. 
Like I said, the set pieces are nice, but they're short-lived, and the moments in between are just very simple street driving with an occasional wiggler blocking the road. It's not the worst track in the world, but certainly not a track that outranks other retro tracks in this franchise. Rome Avanti! If I wanted to dress beyond basic, I would wear this track. The vibe here is cool, and all the parts outside the city are sweet, like the Colosseum parts and whatnot, but it's when you actually enter the city where things go back to your basic, bland, and barren track design. Nighttime aesthetic tracks can only help so far, and lucky for this track, it has a freaking Colosseum to help out as well, but this was just... whatever. And ladies and gentlemen, our final tour track in this whole DLC is Piranha Plant Cove. This one's all right. Initially, I thought this course was below average, but after playing it a few times, I think it's somewhat solid. I really like the setting of the whole thing, kind of has this foreign island theme going for it. Another thing that stands out is most of this track is submerged in water, which is pretty rare in Mario Kart 8's entire track list. With it being in water, though, it does slow down the pacing of this course, but sometimes a pace change isn't always bad. This one's back and forth for me, like there's nothing jaw-dropping about it, but overall, it's not too bad. But holy crap, if there's a track that genuinely made my jaw drop, it's Seness Bowser's Castle 3. Now, a remake like this isn't out of the realm of possibility for something like a GBA revamp, but this is Seness Bowser's Castle 3, not to be mistaken with the GBA Bowser's Castle 3. And wow, I gotta say, I'm blown away. Compared to literally every other SNES track that's been remade in the Mario Kart franchise, this is night and day. Like, the presentation and layout is so dynamic and actually isn't flat for once. They genuinely utilize anti-grav, and the theme here is much more menacing and dangerous. All of this is executed while also being extremely faithful to the original course design and layout. This was a genuine surprise for me, especially with it being a SNES track. But this is a perfect example of how to revamp and remake a SNES track right. I enjoyed this one a lot. And finally, the perfect last course to wrap up the Booster Course Pass, we have the infamous Casual Crusher Wii Rainbow Road. Wow, what a great course to conclude this DLC. This track's consensus has always been deemed the most difficult Rainbow Road, probably because it had an install base filled with Wii Wheel users, but this is such a fun and dynamic track, it's great. The entire race is anti-gravity, which is a slight change, but besides that, it's your typical Wii Rainbow Road experience. I especially like the half-pipe section with this mini gap jump at the end of it. I also always loved this Rainbow Road music. It just tugs on my nostalgia strings, man. I, I don't even know. They even went as far as adding the falling meteor effect slash detail from Wii. Like, that's such a subtle detail, but I love it. It's one of the more challenging tracks for sure, and it's so memorable and incredibly worth having here. And after finishing this last wave, you're greeted with a final send-off with the staff credits, bringing this whole DLC package to an official close. That brings us to the conclusion. The Booster Course Pass started in March 2022 and steadily released waves till the end of November in 2023. This DLC was jam-packed with content. Not only did we get the advertised 48 courses, but we also got an additional 8 characters, 17 Mii costumes, random updates, patches, and tons of quality life improvements to make this almost perfect game all the more better. So for $25 for the entire package, this DLC was one of the best valued packages I've seen in recent years. Like, it's uncommon to see something like this nowadays. So in the grand scheme of things, the Booster Course Pass is really hard to argue about, in my opinion. However, I do have a few final notes. Let's start with the tracks themselves. Overall, we got a solid selection of courses. It's hard to complain when a lot of my personal favorites made it in, like 3DS Rainbow Road, GCN Waluigi Stadium, Mushroom Gorge, DK Summit, Maple Treeway. There's some incredible tracks here. However, looking at this list objectively, this selection is heavily bloated in some areas. We have eight Wii tracks selected, definitely the most represented compared to a system like the GameCube that only got 
got three. And this is coming from a Mario Kart Wii kid, okay? Like, these picks are great. I'm not complaining about this, but I could see some people looking at this negatively. One entry I felt that needed some more love was definitely Mario Kart DS. There were some bangers that sadly missed the boat, like Luigi's Mansion, Airship Fortress, Delfino Square, and DS Bowser's Castle would have been sick. Something I am surprised about is the amount of GBA love throughout the pass. You would think Super Circuit tracks wouldn't be popular picks to bring back, but we got some solid GBA tracks almost every wave. I get that they're small and concise, but still, I'm happy to see Super Circuit get some love. But if we want to talk about a game that got a little too much love in my opinion, it would be Tour. Okay, I know I've harped on these courses enough, but hear me out. 14 city tracks, I feel is a little excessive. Now, it's obvious that preservation for Tour was a top priority. I, I get that, it's a valid reason. But I feel like they could have accomplished their goal of preserving parts of Tour rather than every track, because some of these are just dull. My thought is, is if the public consensus of these tracks are mediocre at best, was preserving these tracks really worth it? Yes, I know that sounds a little harsh, but like, I don't know. Personally, I've only seen a few people genuinely enjoy these city tracks. By the fourth wave, I think I had my fair share of the Mario Kart Tour experience. It's bittersweet. I know these tracks practically gave us this opportunity, but I think they also robbed a bunch of slots for tracks that should have made it in. The original tracks can stay though, like uh, most of those I actually enjoyed. All in all, the Booster Course Pass was a really fun journey. It was something Mario Kart was heavily needing. It had been way too long for some new Mario Kart action, and considering all the tracks and cherries on top for 25 bucks, this was something you couldn't pass up. And the best thing about it was it brought back buzz and excitement to the Mario Kart community. The whole thing was a super smart decision by Nintendo, taking advantage of this ginormous install base and giving them a good chunk of content to chew on, which, coming from me, was extremely appreciated. It's sad to see this Mario Kart era come to an end. Like I said, me and this game go way back. So it's been a long ride, but I seriously can't wait to see what the series has in store for Mario Kart 9. Or is it 10 now? Like. I I don't even, I don't even know. So again, to answer the question, how was the booster course pass? It was good.